Mike, you grew up here. Can you tell me a little bit about the history of Kino that you experienced while you were growing up in Calumet? Tell me a little bit about that. Well, um, so, so I basically I came to the area in the early 60s and uh, Kino City, we used to always come because there was a restaurant here and uh, there was a bar. My dad used to like to go for a few drinks with the boys, and uh, but we used to always come. There was always good food at the restaurant, so us kids would uh, sit across the street and uh, have a burger and fries or there was an Italian uh, lady that, and a family that ran the cafe for a while, Gina and Luigi Cambiotti and they, she always had banana cream pie and she did specials and french fries and all milkshakes, all that kind of stuff. So this was sort of the uh, service uh, industry, uh, this is where it was all set up for a lot of the miners would come here to get away from the mining camp. Uh, what was the place you grew up and lived? Well, I, I mean, when I first came here, I was up in uh, No Cash, small little place so, uh, on the way up to uh, the top of the mountain uh, where Calumet. And then uh, I lived in Calumet for a while. And then in the summer, I used to spend my summers here as a kid because I had a friend of mine. He was His name was Louis Temslin. He was a Norwegian fellow. He was like a grandfather to me. So I lived in a little shack across town with him. And I would spend my summer uh, off of school here in Kino. And I would spend a lot of time playing with the kids in town and just hanging out. How did your father come to Kino area? Well, he, I mean, he, he worked in Belgium with a friend. Uh, they worked in the coal mines in Belgium. And then they heard about the, all the jobs in Canada. So they, they came over to Montreal and he worked his way across Canada. Ended up in Whitehorse. He ended up working for White Pass Railway in Whitehorse. And then he heard about the, the money to be made in the mines. So that's when he came in the late 50s, he came up to, uh, to uh, the Al Sakino area. Uh, there is this term displaced persons or displaced yeah. people. Who were these displaced people? Well, growing up in, in, in this area, there was people from every, you know, every country, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Austria, Germany, uh, Finland, uh, you know, just a whole smorgasbord of European uh, uh, people that, that came up here to, to find work and, and make a living. When did um, gold and silver mining start here in the area? Well, it initiated in the early 1900s. That's, I mean, even before the early 1900s, there was some activity around, but the boom basically started in the early 1900s. Um, with gold and then silver was found on top of Kino Hill and uh, yeah from that, then on it's it's been uh, the mining has take, taken place for you know over a hundred years in this area. What happened when United Kino Hill collapsed or went closed? How was that period? Yeah, I mean, it was um, it, it it closed a few times, but the last time that it closed was 1988, uh, late late 88, 89, and it was devastating for the for the community of Kino and Elsa and even Mayo, because um, it was something that you know everybody had thought would go forever, but 89, they, the decision was to to close things down and. Uh, and just mothball everything. Um, yeah, I mean, every you know, it's all the families that were some families were here 50, 60 years. They, you know, had to had to move, and you know, it was it was one of those things. They just thought it'd go forever and ever, and uh, everybody had to find you know new work. And uh, yeah, it was really a devastating time. Uh, How was the interaction with the native people in the area during the mining? Yeah. Uh, well, dur during the mining, I mean, I uh, th th there was a lot of uh, First Nations that were working for the uh, for the mine. Um, I met uh, uh, many families over the years, uh, from the early '60s and on, um, that uh, f uh, from Natchanike Dun and that that uh, worked in in Elsa and went to school. The kids went to school in Elsa, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think overall, I think um, the employment. Uh, the employment options were were there um, for anybody that wanted to work. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, what is the future of Kino and the whole mining here in the district? What do you expect for the region? Well, I think I think uh, in the last few years uh, there's been a resurgence of interest in the area uh, w with gold and silver. 
there's still a lot of gold and silver left in the area and the price as long as the price stays high I think uh, this area will uh, see a, a big resurgence in mining activity yeah. uh, how can people experience the environmental devastations or degradations yeah the uh, and that's one thing that uh, the environmental uh, um, um, situation that was left behind uh, United Kingdom Hill mines I, I would hope that there's checks and balances in place nowadays with mining that um, it wouldn't you know any mining that's done in the area wouldn't leave a mess that was left back in in the day I would I would hope that there's um, there's a um, you know environmental cleanup at the end of the mining activity that uh, you know it takes place and uh, and they don't you know there isn't just a uh, a process where everything is just left behind after the mine shuts down. What are the benefits of mining activities for local businesses like you are? Well, I I think it's not like the old days. Um, I mean, back in the old days. People could, you know, after shift, they could come to Kino to go to the hotel, have a beer, and uh, just, you know, uh, or to the pub and have a beer. Nowadays, it's um, fly-in. It's mostly fly-in uh, people that come into the camps, and uh, they have a two, two, three-week contract, and they're not really allowed to go out and, and, uh, you know, have a beer or, or, or whatever. Um, so in that respect, the, uh, you know, the people that were waiting. To uh, see the good old days, uh, it's not it's not there. What what the what Kino is getting right now is uh, you know contractors that come up that work for the mine. They're 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 uh, allowed to come out and and uh, you know on the weekends and stuff and uh, you know um, uh, you know whether it is a music festival or whatever they're allow allowed to partake. But it's not like the uh, good, the old days where um, there was a lot of families around and uh, people would come to eat at the restaurant and stuff like that. Everything is pretty much self-contained now, and they just look after themselves. And uh, you know there isn't there isn't really a, a, a push to go out and you know experience the community. They long work long hours and then they they leave. You know, so it's it's a totally different setup than it was back in the in the old days. Uh, tourism is a big thing in the Yukon, but how big is it really, and um, how can you imagine the future of tourism here, so that there are benefits for the community? Well, I think uh, I think the the future of tourism is, is quite good. I mean, basically, when the mine shut down in 1988-89, uh, we basically survived in Kino with tourism. I mean, if it wasn't for tourism, there would be nothing left here. Um, the idea that the mining is starting up again, I think, is a bo is a bonus. Um, but I th I, th I think uh, you know tourism in general, I, I think, is going to get busier. I mean, anybody that's got anybody that's set up here with a business right now, I think, can still do quite well with tourism in the summertime, anyway, and possibly winter tourism too. Uh, can you describe the shape of tourism, kind of tourism that happens here? Well, we're getting people that want to get off the bay, uh, the beaten track. Uh, I mean, we our our numbers are you know our largest numbers maybe two thousand in the summer type thing. What we're getting is a lot of European uh, uh, visitors from Germany, Switzerland, uh, you know, places like like that that they like to get off the beaten path. And what we're also getting is a lot of Yukoners or uh, locals are starting to come up here and discover the area. We've got a lot of lakes and rivers and mountains and. Uh, to to uh, you know ride bikes and hike and uh, you know I mean there's a whole smorgasbord of stuff that people can do up here and um, you know just for a getaway from Whitehorse you know five hour drive or whatever so we're getting a, ver a variety of visitors it's not going to be some it's not going to be a place that uh, we're going to get tour buses and stuff but it's going to be a place that uh, people you know that, that like to do their own thing and just experience nature I think we have a lot we have a, a lot to offer in that respect. When the, mali, uh, when the mill is going on, how is the life in Kino City? Well, it's, I mean, it definitely changes, the, um, changes Kino City in that, you know, when, when, the, when the mining or the mill isn't going, uh, Kino City is tranquil. I mean, there's, you know, you can hear the birds, you can, you know, it's, you're, you're, it feels like you're away from it all. When the mill is going, definitely you can hear the noise of the mill, uh, the mining activity, and it changes the whole dynamic of you know peace and quiet and tranquility. 
Um, it's a tough one. I mean, I, I, I don't know what the solution is to that. But um, in that respect, though, I mean, the, the community gets uh, gets noisier, but, uh, you know, there's you, know, you can go way up into the mountains, up to the signpost or back behind Sourdough Hill and hike, and you don't get that. You know, you, know, you don't hear the, the, the sounds of mining. It definitely affects the community. I mean, it changes the whole aspect of, of Kino. Yeah. And my last question is, uh, the whole reclamation process of the old sites, mining sites, hmm. is that a potential for tourism, mining and tourism? I th well, I think it's a potential for work. I think, it's, yeah, it's a, I think it's potential for tourism. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, reclamation. We're trying to work with them, with the, the also Reclamation uh, Committee to, uh, you know, to save some of the historic buildings. You know, I mean, there's, I think there's a lot that could be done instead of just bulldozing everything and, you know, bringing it back to nature. Uh, the, that's what the tourists want to see. They want to see something of the past. And I, and I think if we work together, um, we can make something that'll work for everybody you know what is the message from you about Kino and the history or the present to the world as a final statement a final statement well all I can say is uh, is if you know if you come up to Kino you get get, get a little bit of everything it's like stepping back in time and uh, you get a little bit of history uh, you get a little bit of uh, wilderness um, it's a unique experience it's um, It's something that I think um, Kino City um, embraces uh, a lifestyle of uh, that uh, that has long passed. Um, and um, for anybody that just wants to get off the beaten path and let their hair down, uh, Kino City is the place to go to come.